Hi, this is Kimberly. You may not think so, but I am a very, very busy bee working on some outstanding material for you. And because of my ADD, I flit around from one project to another. Many started and nothing done, such as my life, my house, my crocheting, my plastic canvas projects. Oh God, I used to love that. I want to love it again. <laughs> and last but not least, my YouTube channel and any other project I endeavor. Many started, nothing done. One thing I've been pondering as I look at my YouTube analytics is I have two types of viewers, just when it comes to my intros, that is. Those that only listen to my intro and those that skip the intro and go straight to the video that I have put together, that I have spent much time putting together. Both parts are hard work. I've put a lot of time and thought into anything I do and I'm not going to skimp on my YouTube channel. I do give you my best and I don't just throw some shit together to pump out videos. This that I will do and this that I do in this Hell spell, spit it out, Kimberly. Do in this video and several more parts that are to come is I'm going to string together my intros that I've done and all of the other parts where I was yakking, with, where I yacked and ran my mouth throughout the video. And because this, I'm doing this because many people have actually said they would listen to me reading the phone book and I thought about reading the phone book but they don't put out those big thick ones like they used to. I'm a very literal person, can you tell? But this will not only encompass Watts videos but all of the other subjects I've done such as McNabb and Bell, T. Stout, Gannon Stout, Joseph and Jennifer Rosenbaum and just any other things I have done. I'm going to start at the beginning and, and stop stuttering, Kimberly. You sound like that fucking Watts dude. So call it recycling or whatever you please. However, please know that behind the scene, Kimberly is hard at work like a little gerbil running, running, running on a little wheel. Isn't that cute? And just and working on other time-consuming videos. The ones that take a long time to put together. I'll work on them, put it aside, work on it, put it aside. And while I work on said videos and clean my house and host company, sleep and deal with what Shanann would say is my health challenges, but they're not necessarily in the order that I of importance of the crap I was blathering on a moment ago. I'm starting to forget what I was trying to say. Did that I will deal with these things and one more thing and it's very very sad. Someone, a very young person, only 31 years old, suddenly passed away in Mr. Kimberly's family. So we will be going to a funeral. I don't know when. She just died this morning. I will be gone for a little bit to tend to that. We will have to travel out of town. As a quick review of what this video will be and some more to come while I work on projects, which are more than a right, there's like quick videos, there's regular videos, and then there's projects. I'm going to be working on projects and other stuff. I don't know. You know what? Just never you mind what I'm doing. It's none of your damn business. Good God Almighty, Glenda. That's rude as hell. Please forgive me. It depends on my fucking mood, okay? And please be patient with how green I was in the beginning. Please don't make a rash decision to unsubscribe or go away or something. You know, piss off because of how horrible I was in the beginning. But it is what it is. Right? Right. While I'm gone, and as a quick review of what this is supposed to be, I'll try to make this more understandable in one sentence. I am posting videos in which I have spoken for those that just wish to hear me run my mouth, starting from beginning of my channel to present. Much love and peace. Thank you for listening and take care. Hi, this is Kimberly. If this video seems familiar to you, it's because I'm doing a re-upload of the original one. The original that I did had very bad sound quality. I'm deleting that and going to upload this in its place. Thank you. 
I'm going to be reading the foreword to All My Broken Pieces by Cindy Watts and Kathleen Houston. It's a rough draft manuscript that was leaked onto Reddit a few weeks back. And this is the foreword and it begins, I decided to write this book after several months of observing the Chris Watts case, not because it was an interesting case, though it is, but more so because there never seemed to be any clear motive. I don't believe that anyone without a violent past or some sign of mental illness would simply turn around one day and murder a pregnant woman and two little girls just because they met somebody new. That didn't wash for me. I've written and researched strange crimes before, and this definitely looked like one. There was a pretty obviously strained marriage and lots of questions, many of them both medical and financial. The crime itself was the very worst that can be committed, killing children, and for that, to my mind, at least, there are never mitigating circumstances, except, I guess, insanity. Was he insane? Was she? Or could it have been drug use? Some kind of amphetamine might cause this, and what was in those patches? Some miracle weight loss because he looked astounding in his before and after photos. Or it was simply speed which explained the weight loss, lack of sleep, as reported by him and his girlfriend, and his seemingly over-the-top energy. Amphetamine rage makes people do the most horrible things. I remember the Jeffrey McDonald case, pregnant woman and two little girls of exactly the same ages. The late writer Joe McGinnis had, I thought, proved in the seminal fatal vision beyond any doubt that he had indeed killed his family, as had the prosecutor in North Carolina. North Carolina, Fayetteville, so close to where Christopher and Shanann Watts grew up and met. Odd that. Yes, it was similar to Jeffrey McDonald, wasn't it? The handsome young doctor, who had no history of violence, but had in one terrible hour destroyed all their lives, his included. Why? The only answer that made sense, if that is the right word, were those diet pills. And diet pills, at least back then, were amphetamines. Could this tragedy have occurred again? Maybe so. You can buy anything on the internet, and try as I might, I can't find a lab test on the ingredients in those patches he was covered in. Well, so was she. Was that what happened? Then again, I don't think she looked like she could have been using speed. She wasn't fat. She wasn't thin. She looked normal. But then there were all those illnesses and maybe an elective neck surgery. And at least some of those must have led to opiate use. And that's really just heroin. And people don't always behave normally on heroin either. So, okay, drug use seems a serious possibility. I'll look into it, I decided. The medical records are sealed, but old-fashioned investigating just might turn up some proof. We'll see. Then there were the respective families. That's always a horrible thing to witness, whether you know them or not. The grief, the endless pain, and in the last couple of decades, that pain is always made a million times worse by having your every single act since the day you were born scrutinized by millions of people on the internet, along with the usual media, and that's just for the parents of the victims. They don't get a pass either. It's the wild, wild west on the net, and since all of us can know every Thing we usually want to. Then there were his parents. They looked so nice and terribly devastated. They looked lost. Did the son they loved so much and thought, as all parents must, that they knew so well, could he do this awful thing? How could he have? Why? 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 I saw that they were being tried and were losing in the court of public opinion. This aspect was also both interesting and puzzling to me. For nearly the same time that the Watts family was imploding into violent murder in Colorado, a beautiful woman and her two fairly breathtaking young daughters were shot and killed in a million-dollar home in San Antonio, Texas. As in the Watts case, the possible suspect of the crimes, mother came forward and spoke of her love for her son, her certainty that he never could have done this thing. Funnily, that also happened in the McDonald case long ago, but no one hated Mrs. McDonald for her loyalty to her son. No one seemed to feel that way about Mrs. Wheeler in Texas either, save maybe possibly the family and friends of Nicole Olson and her daughters. It's odd, isn't it? Who we choose to judge and who we don't. I wonder why this mother was singled out for so much hatred, for doing what most mothers do, 
are in fact expected to do to love their children no matter what. There were people who even seemed to think the Watts family did not love or miss their small granddaughters because they still loved their son and were asking questions. It was obvious from the beginning that neither of them were fond of Shanann. Well, if we're being honest, few mother and daughters in law are all that close. But this one seemed worse than most because his parents weren't at the wedding. Then there was Nutgate. Most daughters-in-law don't make loads of Facebook postings, which basically accuse mothers-in-law of attempting to murder their grandchildren. But this one had. Wow. Yikes. There was, I knew, quite a backstory there, and I wanted to know what it was. I also was beginning to feel sorry for Chris Watts' family. They hadn't killed anyone, allegedly or in real life. All they had done, as far as I could see, was keep loving their own child. And don't all parents do that, no matter what you're supposed to? The other crime they were committing was not saying anything about their grief at Shanann. So, okay, I thought they aren't being hypocrites. After all, they were only a couple of weeks beyond the attempted murder allegations of Nutgate when the real murders occurred. People sanctify the dead a lot, and that's normal, I guess, unless it's Hitler or somebody. On the other hand, if someone you have disliked heartily for a long time dies, someone maybe you had been in a terrible fight with, say because they called you an attempted child killer on the net dies, is anything but pretty gross hypocrisy to go on TV and tell people how much you love them and how much you miss them? To me, the answer is no. Okay, fine, moving on. Now I had other questions. What is it like to be a completely average, nice, hard-working American family one day and become America's most hated family, a warning to young children the next day? To say it would suck is probably the biggest understatement on planet Earth. I decided to talk to them if I could. I wrote a letter, and after a while, Cindy wrote me back. It was such a polite, sad little letter that it broke my heart. Politeness in the face of all that, and to a writer, wow. Over the next few months, we began to write more and then talk. She was even kinder and sadder and more terribly lost than she appeared on TV. I spoke to her husband, Ronnie, a sweet, old-school, hard-working, southern gentleman, and then to her really wonderful daughter, and I started to not just like them, but to feel protectively about these nice people who, let's face it, had done nothing wrong. So there you are, the reasons for the book, and what I'm hoping to find out over the course of it. But it's not just my book, it's Cindy's too. She needs a place to tell her story and to explain her feelings, and history with Son and Shanann and her granddaughters. She needs a place to try and explain and find out for herself what really happened, or try. Because Shanann and Celeste and Bella are gone now, they are beyond our questions and beyond caring about our judgments now. This book is for the living their stories about before and after. Kathleen McKenna Houston, San Francisco, California, July 2019. All My Broken Pieces, A Story of Motherhood, Love, and Loss. This part is by Cindy. It's a foreword. This is allegedly Cindy Watts' book found on Reddit a couple of days ago. And she starts off, I don't think even once, not when I was a little girl even, that I expected or wanted everyone in our country to know my name. Maybe every little girl dreams of being a princess and now an internet star, but they didn't have internet stars when I was a kid, and they don't have any princesses or stars at all where I've always lived, except for those in the sky. If anyone had been interested or asked me ten years ago what I wanted, I would have told them I already had it. A good marriage to a fine man and two wonderful children. By back then, I have to qualify and say that I mean back before my son married a woman that was wrong for him and began to lose himself, and we began to lose him as well. Our pain started then, and over the next eight years, our lives tilted downhill and became sadder, more complicated, and filled with growing amounts of unwanted trauma and fear, until we finally ended up here at the bottom, in a damaged, grieving heap, broken into pieces. Two of our granddaughters are dead. The young woman who was our daughter-in-law is dead, and her family is devastated as well. 
Our boy is in many ways as lost to us as though he were dead. Our family is in rubble, and the whole world seems to know our names and hate us. We just exist and try to breathe through permanently constricted throats, trying to find a way, any way at all, to go on living for what we have left, who we have left, including each other, in our new reality, which is simply moment by moment wreckage. I am not writing this book to ask for sympathy. I'm writing it because there are always three sides to every story. Hers, his, and the truth. Maybe I cannot know the truth any more than all the millions of strangers worldwide who seem to think they do. But I know some things. I know our family. I know my son. Or maybe I don't, and I wish to gain understanding of him and his actions through this process. And to a degree, I know the story of the marriage that led us all here. I want to tell people about these things, I know at least, as to what I hope will come of it. Well, I don't hope for much anymore, but no matter what you think of me or us, remember this. Chris is still my child, and if you have ever had and loved children, then you wish to hold them and comfort them when they are damaged. You wish to make it right. I can't make this right, and I may never hold my son again, never able to comfort him. I can tell my story, though, or my truth, if you will, and hope for understanding. This is the story of us before, during, and after the slide. It's the story of our son meeting and marrying Shanann, and what occurred during their marriage. It's the story of our granddaughters as we know them, or as we knew them, and our son's life during those years, and their aftermath. This is about us, a group of ordinary people as we actually are, and not as those who think they know us, or might wish us to be because if what they say of us were true, then something like this could never happen to you or someone you love, and that reassurance I can't give anyone anymore. As painful as the words of strangers are, those who know nothing of us but feel they do, I hold no grudges. I might have thought the same as they do before when it wasn't us. Before meaning before my family became one of those that people read about and shake their heads over and then immediately run to their laptops and say such things as, I guess I would have drowned him at birth. Or if that wasn't personal enough, they speculate about whether it was me or my husband, Ronnie, who is the psychopath, and whose horrible parenting, or genes, take your pick, or choose both, has twisted up our boy so bad that he was always destined to grow up to become a family annihilator. The worst, of course, the very worst, and I think what truly drove this book, is the people who have written that my beautiful young grandson is going to grow up to be another Chris. God help you to find more kindness for an innocent boy, and maybe to find in these pages the answer that there aren't any real answers. I mean, as to how this tragedy happened, or what could have stopped it, because you can't see if we could have, we would have. Please, if nothing else, believe that. I'd like to thank you, the reader, for listening to my story and for giving me your time as I travel this road again. Chris was really a good kid. It's not just me who says so. Everyone who ever met and knew him said so, too. He was very gentle and quiet, never caused us a single problem. He was an honor student who loved sports and made a nice life for himself in Mooresville, North Carolina, after high school and then NASCAR Tech. Then he met Shanann. We have chapter one now, All My Broken Pieces, A Story of Motherhood and Love and Loss. Chapter one. Everybody talks about their dreams for their children, but I think I can safely say that there is only one that we parents have. We just want them to be happy. Of course, there is no bigger dream, and in many cases, nothing harder to achieve. And the difficult thing is, we really can't do one thing about helping them to be happy. That's mostly down to luck, I think. Our boy's luck ran out pretty early on. I don't think I worried about him as much when he was little. He was such a good kid, and in high school he played baseball and got straight A's, so I didn't have any reason to worry, but I did anyway, because he was so incredibly shy and quiet, and I didn't want him to be lonely or missing out on all the silly adventures that we parents complain about but expect anyway, and then later shake our heads over and laugh. He was terribly serious at an age when most kids aren't. Our daughter was so busy and overscheduled with friends and boyfriends and keeping AT&T in business and pushing our rules that it was hard not to notice the differences between them as teenagers. Still, what more could I have 
reasonably wanted than a son who did all the right things and just seemed to enjoy going to see NASCAR races with his dad while maintaining high grades and playing sports. And yet, okay, I'd hear from my mother, who the kids called Oma, about the school pickups. I was working, and so she would go and collect the kids for me after school. She'd drive up to get Chris first at his elementary school, and promptly out he would come, my sweet boy ambling out the door, giving her his quiet smile and saying thank you as he got into the car to wait with her for his sister. Wait they did too. Sarah was so popular. By the way, let me stop it here. For whatever reason, Chris Watt's sister, Jamie, her name in this book has been changed to Sarah. So, wait they did too. Sarah was so popular that it could take her a good half hour or more after school to say goodbye to all of her friends that she wouldn't get a chance to talk to by phone in an hour or so. It used to drive my mom crazy. Both my kids were born kind. It's just that Sarah never met a stranger in her life, and Chris, well, he liked people just fine, but he came out reserved and quiet, just like his dad, and he stayed that way. He had a few close friends, and I guess if I wondered how it would go for him later, and I did because I'm a mother. I hoped that somewhere out there ahead of him was a sweet girl who would think like I had about Ronnie and value him for what he was. She would, I hope, simply enjoy being with my sweet, good, hard-working boy and build a life with him. With Sarah, I knew she would have her pick and pick right when she was ready, and she did. She went to college, fell in love with Steve, married him, and started her career and living happily ever after in the usual small starter house. With Chris, I didn't think so much as hope for the best. He was so shy, in fact, that a girl had to ask him to senior prom. So I think if I can remember correctly, I guess I knew he'd have to meet a pretty outgoing girl to bring him out of his shell. I knew that when he did, he'd be completely devoted to her and try his very best to make her happy. And since he is so much like his dad, I figured her chances for that were better than average. After high school, Chris, who like his dad, could fix anything mechanical that had been invented and set his sights on the NASCAR Academy. And so off he went at 18, and after he completed his schooling there, he was hired by a Ford dealership in Monroeville. He's always been a hard worker, and he liked the work too. And he, we had raised both our kids to be careful about money. Sorry, one more break here. Every once in a while, there's like some bad grammar and stuff, but and it'll kind of trip me up. And sometimes I just trip up because I'm me. Okay, let me start over after he was hired by a Ford dealership in Monroeville. He's always been a hard worker, and he liked the work too. And he... We had raised both our kids to be careful about money. For a while there, it seemed like he had learned it, too, because he started right off by saving up about every cent that didn't go to rent and food. And before too long, he had bought a brand new car, a Ford Mustang, and he only owed $8,000 on it while managing to put another 11000 into savings, which is pretty good for a young man of 24. Ronnie and I are careful people, so nothing about Chris's finances surprised us then. In what spare time Chris had, he continued his lifelong enjoyment of exercise and being outside and coming down to visit us and his sister and our new family member, Sarah's little boy named Wyatt. And of course, he took every opportunity to go see NASCAR with his dad. I was glad of that too. I love Ronnie, but those races are too loud for me and I don't think I was missed. Those two loved hanging out together. Our family stayed close and we saw a lot of Chris, despite the three-hour drive from Monroeville to Spring Lake. He and Wyatt had become best friends, too, and Uncle Chris made was always a favorite visitor for him and Sarah and Steve were expecting their second baby, which we were all overjoyed about. There were no commas there. That was hard to read. I think we were all happy in that simple way of being so without noticing it. I guess by that, I mean things were on track. Our kids were doing well, and their entries into adulthood had almost been a paint-by-numbers deal. School, jobs, marriage, and a baby for our oldest, and Chris was so young that we weren't at all concerned that he hadn't met anyone special yet. 
Then we got a call from Chris that he had in fact met a girl and she was special and he wanted us to meet her too. Sarah, who is by far the most outgoing member of our family, decided to host a barbecue. Nothing big, just a casual little thing with a few friends and family. We weren't nervous exactly, but we were a little surprised because Chris had sheepishly announced to us that his new girlfriend was 40. And since he was only 24, well, I can say that I thought I was definitely curious, though. I can't say what I thought, but I was definitely curious, though. When Chris arrived, it was with a young, pretty, dark-haired woman. Her name was Shanann King, and she didn't look anywhere near 40. Ronnie didn't seem to be bothered by it, but Sarah and I did a little whispering in the kitchen, wondering why Chris had told us that she was so much older than she obviously was. Finally, we asked him. He grinned and brought Shanann over, and they laughed and said it had been her idea. Wasn't it hilarious? We laughed, too, but to this day, I never have figured out why she wanted us to think she was so much older. Still, Chris seemed to like her a lot, and she was very friendly and outgoing, and who gets every joke anyway? So we weren't worried. I suppose we were happy he had found someone he liked enough to want to introduce us to, and she seemed to have a lot going for her, an extraordinary amount of things, actually. She, as was it as it turned out, only a year older than Chris, and she was pretty and very outgoing, which probably was an excellent thing since he was so shy. She could bring him out of his shell, is I guess what I thought. Remember, please, I'm trying hard here to look back as honestly as I can. All of us have to keep doing that to remember how it was, not how it became if we were going to attempt this story. She was pretty and funny, and in the beginning it seemed like she wanted all of us to be friends and to get to know each other and, well, those normal things. Also, we're a family that believes in hard work and trying to do the best you can. And when we met her, she was driving a Cadillac Escalade from the company she said she worked for, Dirty South, and then there was her house. Now, a lot of money in big houses don't mean anything to me personally. I don't want to live anywhere but in our little 1100 square foot house until the day I die. But I know those things are important to a lot of people and that's fine. Hard work, whether it's your own personal satisfaction, as well as putting a roof over your head, no matter how small or large, seems to me to make people feel good about themselves. And the roof Shanann had put over her head with her hard work was a big one. In fact, it looked like a mansion. It was, as Sarah commented to me, the biggest and grandest house she had ever seen, then or now. It had three formal living rooms, for heaven's sakes, and each one of them very well, every room had the most beautiful furniture I had ever seen, and all of them. It sat right beside a lake, and there was a boathouse, too. For the people who lived in that subdivision, I'm guessing a boat wasn't out of the question. Her bedroom was massive and beautiful. She had these little clocks and things that she had ordered from Switzerland. It was perfect, like a castle, and she said that she had bought and paid for it with her job from Dirty South by the age of 25. She told me, in fact, that when she had approached the builders and told them what she wanted, they didn't take her a bit seriously until she opened up a suitcase she had brought and pulled out $20,000 in cash. You had to be impressed no matter what. I saw years later that her brother Frankie said that she was always a hard worker and she was making half a million a year. And to maintain that house, I think you would have to be pulling that in. Like I said, she was also driving a company car from Dirty South, though she had told Sarah that she was either taking a break from there or had quit. Sarah isn't positive which, and she said that she was working as a nanny at the time. She also mentioned that she had worked at Gap previously, so I don't have any idea how how she was managing it all. She didn't come from any more wealth than Chris had, just nice ordinary people. And if she won the lottery, which I could believe she didn't mention it, she would have. Because right, doesn't make sense, but because right from the start, Shanann pretty much said everything she thought and told us a lot about her life. We heard right away about her lupus and fibromyalgia and her migraines. The endometriosis and celiac disease was brought up later. She told us she was was divorced from a man who had, she had put through school and that he had been physically unattractive and despite that he had also cheated on her. She also told us that she had recently been
been in a single car accident and had hurt her neck. She might have said that she had gone through the windshield, too. I can't be sure. She seemed to be healthy and happy all the times I, we saw her, so I suppose she was just a very strong person. At any rate, despite some confusion on how she had managed the house or where she worked, I think she just dazzled Chris. Sure, he was supporting himself and doing really well especially for his age, but she was living in a house that cost nearly half a million dollars and had furniture and art inside that was probably worth half that again, and her car was an Escalade after all. So if she had started talking to him right away about what to do with money, he most probably would have listened to her. He certainly seemed to be listening to everything she told him right from the beginning. And that's the end of chapter one. We'll pick up in the next video at chapter two. Thank you. Hi, this is Kimberly. Like I said in my last video, I'm doing this recycling thing of my old videos where I replay the intros and anything closely resembling reading the phone book. We are at the very beginning of my channel where I was a complete nervous wreck. I started off with a bang by quickly grabbing screenshots of a leaked version of the book that Cindy Watts was writing with a real-life author. There is someone always in the group that can't be trusted with something like that, with a printed copy of a book that's yet to be released. Seems like this happened before. And they go around posting copies of yet-to-be-released books, and I guess because they feel the author should not make any money from it, or some moral reason such as that. Who knows what they're warped thought process was or is, and, but I took a copy, and yes, I felt dirty and naughty. I was a bad, bad granny. Mr. Kimberly was in a line of work before he retired to take care of me full time, but he sternly frowns upon shenanigans of this nature. I do hate disappointing him. It just hurts me so, but he should be used to it by now. So, the start of my channel was rather vanilla at first, if you will, as far as my speaking roles. It didn't take me long to warm up. Just wait. Do you guys understand that this means reliving the whole copycat conundrum clusterfuck days? Give me a yay or a nay down in the comments, and I will seriously consider your desires. And then I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. So, by doing this recycling assignment, it's kind of like when Shanann would ply the children with marshmallows to get them to stop doing that I'm hungry whiny thing. But, I've got an important operation going on here at the Kimberly household. I want to just prop up in bed and alternate salty and sweet snacks while I catch up on forensic files and drift in and out of a deep sleep and stuff. I mean, oh, scratch that. I'm working on other things that require time and patience and organizational skills, but I have none of those. I have zero fucks. I mean, zero, I don't know. My resourcefulness is on intermission. I'm at ultimate organizational capacity. Is that like that flux capacitor thing? Anyway, isn't one supposed to linger in the summer? I've never liked the lazy days of summer ever since I became a mom. Fuck all that shit. But if I may be frank, instead of Kimberly, <laughs> I did this because, well, Damn it, y'all aren't watching anything else besides all that drama show Watts Island bullshit with its unremitting breaking news and all the stations are doing four and eight hour live broadcasts. I can't compete with that shit. I don't even have one single mod. So when I say fuck it, and I do, fuck it, a full performance, full scale operation, Kimberly's channel, will come to a screeching halt, and not a blessed thing gets done. 
D-U-N, done. Stick a fork in me. I'm done. I'm going to have to be put in this Watt Island melodramatic spectacle theatrics psychodrama terminological inaxitude bullshit extravaganza commotion to bed soon. I'm all sunburned and shit. I gotta go. I gotta get off Watts Island. But I, I love the summer and stuff, so I'll be back. But come along, Kimberly. It's time to go. Much love and peace. Thank you for listening. Chapter 2 of Cindy Watts' alleged book, All My Broken Pieces. Chris lived and worked in Charlotte, and so we didn't see as much of him as we would have liked. And he's never exactly been the chatty type on the phone. I'm sort of that person, too, who figures no news is good news. I knew he had a pretty new girlfriend and work, and so I didn't worry. He talked to his dad by phone, and I knew if there were any problems, Ronnie would tell me, and he didn't mention anything, so why worry? We met her parents when they came up, and her brother, and they seemed like nice people. I'll admit, too, that I wasn't looking to get really close to Shanann, not because I disliked her, but because the conversations were so personal, and they made me a little uncomfortable. There are a lot of people who like to tell you everything about themselves when they meet you, but I'm not one of them, and that's okay in both directions, I think. Like I said, I wasn't worried. The first time I did become a little concerned was at our grandson Wyatt's third birthday party. Sarah was pretty pregnant then with Ruby, and the party was just going to be a small backyard one. Wyatt, like most little boys, had a Power Rangers toy he liked. Shanann knew about this, and she suggested that it be a Power Rangers party. Our daughter is a pretty easygoing girl, and so she didn't mind if Shanann wanted to help out or whatever. At any rate, one of Shanann's ideas was that she and Chris show up at the party dressed as Power Rangers, and I guess she got him to rent the outfits or buy them. I'm not sure which. But when the day came, Chris had forgotten the helmets. Bearing in mind it was a three-hour drive from where he lived to Sarah's house, and that Wyatt was three, and that all of us were just happy he could come. It took us all aback when Shanann told him in no uncertain terms that he was going to turn right back around and drive straight back three hours to get the helmets, and then return. A six-hour trip, and obviously another three hours back home for a total of twelve hours on the road. And for what? We all asked him that and told him not to go. Don't be silly. Wyatt could care less. Just stay and enjoy yourself. Visit with us and relax, we said. But it was Shanann he was looking for approval already, and he was anxious. We had never seen him look that way, and Chris was always a relaxed kid and young man. But she told him to go back and get those helmets, and that's just what he did. I guess that was the first time we began to worry, and it was just the beginning. Chapter 3 like every other family, when their adult child falls in love, it wasn't going to matter what we thought about their kid's new love interest. What would matter is what we said, which, if you ever want to have a continuing relationship with your child, better be nothing at all. And so that's what we did. I mean, who knows? People on the internet call me a crazy, possessive mother, and Chris seems to allude to that a little bit in his first interview, where he said, and I quote, My mom was a little hesitant, unquote. The detective jumped in and said, quote, yeah, losing her baby and all, unquote. He shrugged and smiled. I have to admit, I was a little taken aback by his answer, because this was just a few weeks after Shanann had written about me on Facebook, and she had written a lot, saying, amongst other things, that Sarah was the golden child and that Chris was always second. Sometimes you really can't win. The simple truth is that I have always been crazy about both our kids, and so is Ronnie. But yes, I have been extremely close to my daughter, who is an astounding young woman, and who, with our beloved, very nice son-in-law, generally shares time with their children and themselves with us. That doesn't mean I love her more. We just had more in common. For example, we like to talk to each other. Something Chris and Ronnie definitely had in common was that they did not have much to talk about when together. Not that you can talk anyway at drag races or NASCAR unless you like to speak with bullhorns. Ronnie's closeness to Chris does not mean he loved him more than Sarah. These are just untrue things and they are hurtful from anyone. There's a good old-fashioned poem about this. I guess that everyone could agree on. A daughter is a daughter all of your life. A son is a son till he takes a wife. It just means really that you pretty much have to understand and accept that once your kids grow up and marry, things will be different. 
And if you want to see them and want to keep peace, you need to like their choices, whether you do or not, especially if you have grandchildren. I got lucky with Sarah's choice, Steve. Not so lucky with Chris's choice. But I figured it didn't have to be a disaster. We could be polite and friendly. And if so, maybe Ronnie and I would get together every other Christmas with them. And that was the best any parent can hope for, really. So getting back to then, Chris was obviously in love, and we were keeping quiet and going on with our lives, and a few weeks later, Chris called us up to tell us he had just bought an engagement ring for Shanann, one they had picked out together, and before I could say congratulations. He went on to tell me that he had paid $12,000 for it. I have to say I was shocked. $12,000 is a down payment on a house, or he could have paid off his car, or it was $1,000 more than he had in his savings account. And besides, he was an auto mechanic, not Prince William or Donald Trump. Maybe what I just said will make people laugh at me, because maybe that's what not a lot of money to other people, but it is to our family. I said, son, you know money doesn't grow in trees. Couldn't you have found something nice for less money? He didn't say anything, and I think he, I handed the phone over to Ronnie, but I found out later he had told Shanann what I had said, and she got really angry about it. I was sorry to hear that because I had been trying really hard to maintain a relationship with her during this time. She had the habit of saying confiding things to me, and like I said, I'm not used to someone I don't don't know being that open. Or maybe the problem from my standpoint was that all of her confidences to me were about how sort of pathetic she found my son. It's possible, I suppose, that she blamed me for his shortcomings, and she hoped that by telling me how he couldn't even wash dishes right or cook, or how the way he dressed embarrassed her, and how she didn't like his hair or his weight either, he was too skinny, that we could maybe collaborate on improving him together and become closer. I didn't like it, though, and I know it showed. But now she was going to be our daughter-in-law, and that meant if Chris didn't mind her criticism, then I had better stop minding it for him. We made a new start, a reset. It would begin at the beach house that Sarah and Steve had already rented for a coming stay, a family week. Chris had already been invited, and we knew that he was bringing Shanann even before the ring announcement. The plan was for all of us to spend time together and enjoy each other and witness the formal proposal she wanted him to make with the ring. Shanann managed to find a nearby beach house on the same street as the one our family was in for her family to stay in. That sounded good, too, a chance to start getting to know our future in-laws better, and we could all become good friends before the wedding. Everything went okay at first. We were all happy to be on the beach. Chris and Shanann in particular loved being outside all day, and they really were a beautiful couple, and they seemed to be in love and happy, and the Rusiks were delighted with our boy, and well, yeah, it seemed like this might end up well after all. Sarah and Steve and Wyatt and our brand new granddaughter were there and having a good time too. The sun shone, and at least from my perspective, our Wyatt was like having the sun around all the time. He was such a happy, handsome little guy, always ready for an adventure, and for Wyatt having Uncle Chris around was as good as Christmas. Chris and Uncle was a good buddy rolled up into one. He played with him and looked like he was having as much fun doing it as Wyatt. Little kids do know the difference between someone who really enjoys their company and someone who is doing it for show. Though I'll admit they'll take the latter if the former isn't available, and after all it's better than not having any attention at all. Kids aren't stupid. So Wyatt didn't even want to eat breakfast first in the morning without including his pal Uncle Chris. He'd march right into the bedroom that Chris and Shanann were at, staying in and knock and holler good morning to helpfully wake up Chris so that he didn't miss any part of the fun. I guess like all adoring grandmas, I am definitely one of those. I thought it was adorable. We all did. Well, not all of us, apparently. The second morning it happened, Chris found me in the kitchen and asked me to, to keep Wyatt from knocking on their door. I was surprised and asked him why. He said Shanann didn't like it and it was ruining her morning sleep. I was annoyed and told him that he could tell his sister that himself if he wanted it to stop, and that he knew how much Wyatt loved him and this would hurt his feelings. What was the big deal anyway? It wasn't that early. Chris looked a little embarrassed and shrugged and said, well, it's her vacation too, I guess. Anyway, that was the end of it as far as I knew. Something else happened that week, which was much worse, but our family doesn't discuss it, and it wasn't between me and Shanann, and Chris didn't hear about it. 
I think she meant to say that it was between her and Shanann, and Chris didn't hear about it. Let me just read that last part again, please. Something else happened that week, which was much worse, but our family doesn't discuss it, and it wasn't between me and Shanann, and Chris didn't hear about it. The proposal happened during the week as well. Chris and Shanann went down to the beach. Okay, I see what she's saying now. It, it was not between her and Shanann. Sorry for the interruption. The proposal happened during the week as well. Chris and Shanann went down to the beach with the photographer she had hired, and Chris popped the question, and she said yes, and then they posed for pictures that they later showed us. They were in their swimsuits, and they looked young and beautiful and happy. Chris was still very slim and muscled then, and so was she, and everybody got a little choked up that there was going to be a wedding, and then we all went home. And while I wouldn't have said it had gone smoothly, I decided to try and not think about it anymore and just get on with things. Then I received an email from Shanann that shocked me completely. The gist of it was she wanted me to know that she did not like me one bit. She thought that I was a bad influence and a bad mother to Chris. She said she knew I did not like her either, and the less we saw of each other, the better. I had never said an unkind word to her. I felt like I had been over backwards to welcome her into our family, and I also thought wrongly, obviously, that I had hidden my doubts about her. It would be a lie to say I was completely devastated by that email. In my whole life, no one had ever said anything like that to me. Like Chris, I'm shy. I don't get into arguments with people or raise my voice. I cried, and I showed it to Ronnie, who told me not to answer and to just forget about it. My husband really can do things like that. I didn't take his advice. I wish I had now, because what does any of it matter anymore? It did then, and then is what I'm having to remember now. I wrote her back. I told her how badly she had hurt my feelings. I told her that whatever it looked like or not, that I was trying. I told her that I didn't like the way she talked about my son or the way she acted with my grandson, but that at least I was making an effort. Then I think I told her that I wouldn't have ever written an email like this if I hadn't have gotten hers. And it all seems so stupid and petty now. And it was then ugly and petty and as sorry as a beginning as a family trying to blend could have. I didn't say anything to Chris, though, because they had just gotten engaged. And it would have upset him, and Ronnie said not to, and he was probably right. I don't know what I thought would happen, but what I wanted to happen was for it to go away, and not to ever have her or anyone really be as mean to me as that again, or make me lose my temper as I had. I couldn't deal with things like this, and up until then, I had never had to. So, having been hit and having responded to my shame, I decided to turn the other cheek and try harder. This, as it happens, was not a very good plan either. That's the end of chapters 2 and 3, and I will pick up with chapter 4 in the next video. Much love and peace. Thank you for listening. Hi, this is Kimberly. If you've not been here for the last couple of Kimberly videos, I've been doing my part for the planet by recycling old videos. I'm in essence making a collection of my intros and also pulling out anything else that I find that where I am running off at the mouth. Now, I knew I would probably get some new people over here to the quieter side of the island. Lots of people are vacationing, but they've been attracted by the flashy lights, live streams, merch, and fast talkers in the slow mode chat. It's just whizzing by over there on the big island. I'm on an islet. It's still Watts Island. I've just branched off is all. Along with new visitors comes those that don't understand me the same as my loyal viewers do. Those that have been around for a while. But some of these tourists, they just jump right in, go off on the deep end and make assumptions. Feeling that they know enough about me from this one video to draw conclusions and then heckle me. I also usually get a new influx of visitors each time they do a television special, like on Lifetime, Oxygen, and Netflix. And like many passers through, they decide to fill out a comment card, letting me know how their brief stay on the island was, which is much appreciated. Well, thank you. And, well, I don't mean to complain, 
but you know I can't hold it in. I tried to talk to Mr. Kimberly, and he waved his arm and said I should take this to the interwebs and give him a break and let him watch the news. I pretended like I didn't notice he was joking. In this comment, it's actually fairly typical of some of the people that come through here, you know, on a quick vacation. They were expecting one thing, I reckon, and got me. But this particular travel groupie needs a lamp shoved up his ass, so he'll lighten up. Please, allow me to share this lovely note with you that he left in my comment section on the last video that I did. Just look at this. Dude, your voice is the most depressing ever. Are you on drugs, alcohol, and antidepressants? Because I see a woman ready to cut her wrists, blow her brains out, or drunk in a ditch swearing to anyone that happens to be around. Get a life because you get people sick with your ramblings and innuendos. What an uplifting comment. I'm going to follow his advice. I will get a life. You know what, you fucking dick. Leave that comment for the right person and they just may harm themselves. Will you be satisfied then? You're fucking sick as Chris Watts. Fuck out of here. And my standard canned response would be, thank you for your feedback, asshole. Fuck out of here with your bullshit. This guy's name is Don Joe. Ha ha ha. If, you know, anyone wants to reply this fucking shit, well, aren't you down to earth? But not quite far down enough. But I have to ask, why are you here? I'm sorry if you found my normal behavior to be highly inappropriate. And by sorry, I mean get the fuck over it. Learn a lesson from a cat. No matter what life brings you, kick some kitty litter over that shit. And then walk out all nonchalant. Like, you don't smell it. I don't smell it, do you? Move on. God, I wish those that are offended by my channel would react like fainting goats and just quietly tip over, you know, with their little feet up in the air and stuff. And now it's time to remind myself. Someone's inability to see your value does not make you any less valuable. That's why it's called self-worth. It's up to you, not them. Touche. I got that. I got it. Since we are recycling, let's move that shit pile rubbish the fuck out of here. Can someone please show this fucking dustbin to the exit door? P.S. If you enjoy shitheads insulting me in the comments, there's plenty more where that came from. Please check back soon for an upcoming Bits and Bobs video. I will now perform a dramatic reading. I mean, I will now play the previously recorded video, chapters 4 and 5 of the book that never came to fruition. Cindy Watts, All My Broken Pieces. Much love and peace. Thank you for listening. Chapter 4. Sarah was upset about the week at the beach and concerned that Shanann blamed any fallout on me, but she's not a woman who likes problems or conflicts, and she's very definitely has her own life and a demanding career, so she just wanted to ignore any incipient family drama, and she advised me to do the same. That sounded good, so I decided to take her advice, and together we offered to throw a bridal shower for Shanann. It had been pretty obvious from the pick of the $12,000 ring and the public engagement that Shanann was going to want a big wedding. She said she had never had one with her first marriage, and there are loads of women who want fairy tale days, so we didn't think it was strange. Sarah had gotten married right out of college, and we had gone into debt to give her a nice wedding. And, like a lot of young marriages, it hadn't lasted but a minute. Ronnie and I hadn't judged, we just shrugged it off, and if we thought of it at all, we just thought how beautiful our girl had looked that day. Later on, when she married Steve, just went up to a mountaintop and did it, but I know every girl wants that day once. Sometimes I think more for the wedding experience than the marriage, but whatever I think isn't going to put much of a dent in America's queen for a day wedding industry, one way or another. Anyway, it was obvious that she could afford to have any kind of wedding she wanted. There was the house and the car, and though we didn't think her parents could pay for a big wedding, we knew she could, so why not? 
Our family couldn't do anything elaborate because we simply don't have much money. But Sarah and I both like to cook and decorate tables and make party favors, that kind of thing. So we knew we could give her a pretty bridal shower and then she'd be happy and that would make Chris happy, etc., etc. We knew that Shanann wouldn't want a small bridal shower either at Sarah or I's small houses, so we rented a little clubhouse in Fayetteville she had mentioned liking. It was attached to an apartment complex. Not a big space, but nice. Indeed, her second engagement party would be held there. We asked her for the names and addresses of all of her girlfriends and wrote and sent out invitations to them and her family members. I was the one who mailed out them, not Sarah. A week after the invitations had gone out, the only RSVPs we had were for members of our family and hers. We called Shanann up and told her that we hadn't got any answers from her girlfriends. She gave me their numbers and I called each one. All of them said they had gotten their invitations but hadn't answered because they each had different plans for that day and were not going to be able to make it. There was one exception who said she had been planning RSVP and would be there. Sarah and I had worked hard on the tower and thought it looked beautiful, and our family and hers were there, and she got gifts and lots of attention, but she wasn't happy. You could tell she wasn't. I just didn't realize how unhappy she was until years later, when Sarah and I saw the discovery documents. Chapter 5 Hello again, readers. I know this is an unusual way to do a book. Bear with me dropping in on you and Cindy from time to time. There's a lot of sometimes of boring research that goes into people's life stories, and sometimes it's to come into the book anyway. This chapter is different, and spoiler alert, it's going to run long. There are 1,960 pages in the Chris Watts Discovery file, and there's a great deal of minutiae and some repetition. But there are also pieces of the lives of Chris and Shanann and his family and hers that I think show some fairly terrifying writing on the wall and might help to answer the enormous why of this family's grotesque ending. Following pages are both a letter that Sandy Rusick, Shanann's mother, wrote to Detective Dave Baumhover of Weld County, which details out her memories of her interactions with the Watts family and their answering memories of the same events. Memory is a funny matter. I've spoken to Dr. Saul Kassain, the expert from Making a Murderer, and it seems any one of us can have a false memory, if frightened or upset, and at the time Sandy wrote this, she was suffering from the worst kind of shock and grief a human can experience. Murder tends to wipe out every good thing that came before it and makes you ask yourself if there were ever any good moments at all, or if you just remembered them wrong. It's true for all of us at any given time. In fact, cops hate to take eyewitness statements at car accidents. They never get the same story twice. Nobody even gets the color of the car the same. Yet, are those witnesses lying? If they are, are they conscious of it? Memory is subjective, and so here are both families' memories. I'll leave it to you, the reader, to decide what to believe. The letter from Sandy Rusick is here with, without spelling changes and includes rebuttals from Cindy, which will be in bold font to try and avoid confusion on who is speaking. Thanks for your time, and I'll see you in the next chapter down. And I'm going to stop the video here, and I will read that letter in its entirety next video. It's quite a long letter, plus Cindy has rebuttals. Maybe I'll read half. You know I can't make any promises, all right? Love you. I'm just kidding. It's already recorded. Much love and peace. Thank you for listening. Hi, this is Kimberly. Today we are continuing with Chapter 5 of the assumed or alleged book that never saw the light of day, All My Broken Pieces, that Cindy Watts was co-writing with a book author. After the rough draft that the author sent to Cindy was rudely published to Reddit by someone, and it was quickly taken down. I don't know who published it to Reddit, but they are never to be trusted again. I'm unsure if that was the reason, but after that, things went south from there, and the book deal was scrapped. The author is writing another one on her own, though, without the Watts' input, so at least there's that to look forward to. 
We are on Chapter 5 and the statement that Sandra Rusick wrote for Detective Baumhover in the Discovery is being used and Cindy would like to respond to some of the declarations and allegations, accusations made by Sandy. Sandy and Cindy. Cindy and Sandy. These ladies have no limits or an off button. I'm just going to say that Miss Sandy and Miss Cindy, that's what I'll call them, sounds more polite and friendly that way. But indeed, I will forget to call them that, so never mind. But my goodness, I can't believe they go where they go at times. There must be so much that has been left unsaid, but the, it's sort of like a silent agreement between the families, you know, the, the things they've left unsaid. Wouldn't it be cool to be there and be able to listen to them when they gather for these occasions? But, gosh, my own parents, they just never got involved with my in-laws. It's not like they didn't speak, but they just didn't go there. You know, they would get together at some occasions, but uh, not like it seems that the Watson Rusics did. This statement that Miss Sandy wrote, I don't flip and understand what it has to do with her daughter and grandchildren having been murdered. Some of the shit she talks about. I mean, stuff she talks about. You know what? It doesn't have anything to do with them having been murdered. So, why are you talking about Cindy and Jamie? I mean, Sarah cross-contaminating food at the bridal shower. What does that have to do with anything? It doesn't, right? And with these conflicting stories, somebody is lying. I don't know who, but they have totally different accounts and stories about, well, everything. From the food and the invites and when they were over for barbecues. Again, what the flip does this have to do with anything? You were given a statement to law enforcement. That means things such as, I last talked to Shanann, fill in the blank. I called Bell and CC school that morning. Or my son-in-law was acting weirder than usual. Why didn't Mrs. Rusick and Mrs. Watts have a recorded statement? I'm sure they did, or maybe they didn't, but where the hell is it? I would love to hear it. Am I right? I'm not the only one. And I'd like to let you know that at times, while reciting this chapter for you, I sound like a stiff third grader who's been made to stand up and read in front of the class, and he or she's all reluctant and shit. Sandy's writing, it's not always complete sentence that made sense, so I would stumble and, and then try to, without deviating, try to make it what she meant, I think, but... I know there's some of you that get pissed when I talk about this shit, about grammar and things like that, and but, but it really makes you look ignorant. And please know, everything I am saying here is alleged. It's my opinion, and for entertainment purposes only. And to some of you, I probably sound really rude right now. Well, I mean, it's just common sense. I get annoyed and irritated when people don't use their common sense. Sound judgment that's not based on specialized knowledge. Such as, so far, I have had the common sense not to do a YouTube video in which I say anything too ghastly, at least in the YouTube world, the true crime community, in which I am not to be confused with. Common sense on Watts Island is something so rare, it's a goddamn superpower. It's a fanciful force that is supposed to impart knowledge of the obvious. Regrettably, humans have confirmed again and again that there's nothing of the sort such as common sense. A term that should speak for itself. Think of it, common sense. I found this cute little ditty a while back, and I've saved it for a time such as this. I'm not the author, though I wish I had been. It says, It was announced today that common sense passed away last night in her sleep. Common sense has been bedridden for the past several years as a result of severe atrophy from lack of use. 
Common sense was preceded in death by her mother, personal accountability, and father, integrity. Don't you like that? I do, and it's so true. Common sense to me is what I believe other people should know. Let's go over some examples, shall we? Don't play with sharp objects. If you receive a PDF of a book, don't distribute it. Another example is when I say to Mr. Kimberly, I just had a great idea, and he dryly replies, Oh, Lord. Common sense would tell you, Don't say that shit to your wife. Or, when Mr. Kimberly says to me, What are you babbling about? And I'll say, I just said I love you. It, I'm ending this subject here and now, quick, fast, and in a hurry. I'm done. Enough on that. I'm putting my foot in my mouth properly. But what do we call someone who gets easily confused and fails to use common sense when necessary? That's right, a dumb fuck. This is a whole other variant of unintelligent. There's peculiar, half baked, wooden headed, dumbass, dumb shit, stupid son of a bitch. And then there's dumb fuck. And please know, none of this is directed towards any of the ladies mentioned in this video. Fucking hell, I got off track as per usual with my downward spiraling intro. I was more thinking of Chris and shit and his girlfriend Nicole when I was going off with all that discourteous shit I said a minute ago. Now, during- Now, isn't it true? Like Mrs. Pitmull says. Now, isn't it true? There is a whole to-do back and forth bullshit about the invitations here in this thing that I'm going to read. Could it be that both are telling bits of the truth? I do remember that Shanann said when she was diagnosed with lupus that she lost a lot of friends, that some people didn't believe her. Could it be that when Shanann called them and asked if they had received their invitation and they said no, that they did not get their invitation, could it be that some of them were lying, trying to save face, or Shan maybe Shanann was trying to save face by saying that, who knows, but somebody's lying, or they're probably both telling bits of the truth all throughout this thing, and Miss Cindy, I have a little piece of advice for you. If you don't want someone to get your goat, don't tell them where it's tied up, okay? Thanks. Another thing, I do understand that Sandy was in shock when she wrote her statement for Detective Baumhover. I get that. When something bad happens and it's affected me, I panic. I'm the one babbling and walking back and forth and unable to make a decision. I get it. I totally do. And this whole thing, it's obviously a rough draft manuscript, so I feel badly about some of the shit I've said. Well, not really, but I thought it would be all gracious and refined and shit to say that. Stop talking. Tell them you have to go now, Kimberly. I have to go now, Kimberly. Much love and peace. Thank you so much for listening. In continuing with Chapter 5, it begins. Attention, Dave Baumhover. This is from Sandy. In 2009, Shanann built her house in Charlotte, North Carolina, battling her lupus. Her friend told her about her cousin Chris, saying he was a very nice guy, quiet, etc. So Shanann got a request from him on Facebook. Months later, she called me saying, Mom, I met a nice guy. He is a mechanic. I said, as long as you're happy and he is good to you. Cindy. There isn't too much to add to this paragraph other than to say that the friend of Shanann's was our nephew's former wife, Nicole Canadaic, and that during this time we were still confused as to how to pronounce Shanann's name, as her parents always referred to her as Shannon, and that Chris announced that he was going to change the selling of his name at her suggestion to Christopher, C-R-I-S-T apostrophe F-E-R. And I'll admit we laughed at him. We never heard about Christopher again. Sandy. A few months after that, Shanann and Chris had a family gathering, and Frank, I, and his parents had a cookout. 
They were all floored when they saw her house. Shanann was a hard worker and wanted this to eventually sell and make a profit, to keep doing so eventually to be mortgage free. Comes from a family of contractors. Cindy replies, the barbecue where we first met Shanann's parents was at their house in August of 2010. It's a nice middle class home. I've already mentioned that Shanann was much more open and talkative about personal matters than I am. I found her mother Sandy to be much the same. In the first few minutes that we met, she pointed at Frank Sr. and said, and I quote, I've only had three good years with that man, unquote. Shanann had previously told us that her father was an alcoholic and that her brother had drug problems, which was a conversation I felt badly about as I don't believe in airing family problems. At the time she had spoken, I wondered if Chris in this new kind of tell-all relationship had told her about our own family's private pain. My husband had in 2003 developed a cocaine problem which lasted for an entire year. Chris had been at college at the time and we had never spoken of it outside of our small family. But I figured when Shanann had said about her father and brother that Chris, or as he was temporarily known, Chris Fur, had shared that with her. So I was uncomfortable and sad when Sandy said that about her husband. I didn't know either of it meant that he had been sober for three years and now that she was happy or if he had started drinking after their first three years, I didn't ask back to Sandra. So Shanann was eager to please his parents, waiting on them hand and foot. When Shanann left the back porch, it was just me and Chris's mom. She leaned over to me and said, Shanann was married before? I said, yes, just like your daughter was. And then later, again, when we were alone, she said, I just don't see it. And I said, what? And she said, I don't feel or see that your daughter loves my son. I knew she was going to be a thorn in the marriage because my mother-in-law was the same way. Cindy's response, this is a painful process, I won't lie to any of you. I've never read this before, I didn't read the discovery documents. I've been in a bad place since the murders. I guess I wish I had read it, but I also wish I had never spoken publicly at all about it during that time, because then I also believed everything my son told me. And that is, as I am finding out, no more truthful than this letter of Sandy's. Anyway, Kathleen sent this letter to me when we were at the beach last week, and now I have read it, and so now I want to answer it. The conversation that Sandy refers to about my remarks regarding Shanann loving my son did indeed take place several years later following an argument and then an apology I made. I'll get to that later. As for the remarks about either her daughter being married before or mine, no, that never took place at all. This was a barbecue and we had just met and I don't have intimate conversations, or at least I don't start them with people I don't know. Sandy did over time let me know that she had hated her mother-in-law, but I can't remember how that came up and it certainly wasn't on this occasion. If she thought that about me as Shanann's future mother-in-law, I didn't know and she didn't say. Sandra continuing with the discovery. So every time we had a cookout, his mom and sister were very quiet and distant and we weren't accepted. They made that known. Cindy's response is, I guess all I can say to this is we are a pretty quiet family overall. Ronnie is extremely quiet and Sarah is one of those people who truly believes if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Her husband Steve is also quiet, it's true. So is Chris and all of us hate arguments. I think I can see how a more extroverted type of family might view us as distant, but we weren't trying to be, it's just the way we are. If there is a person in our family who shows emotion or loses their temper, I guess that would be me. But I promise that was before our son and Shanann began their relationship, and I can't remember a single incident where I had before. I usually just put my head down and try to forget about things. Their dating and marriage changed me, and not in a way I'm glad of. Sandra Rusick, Sandy, said, So forward to the engagement party. Shanann had shopped for food, wine, etc., spent a lot. Chris's sister wanted all of the invitations so she could help. So Shanann told me, 
Mom, she wants to help send off the invitations. What do you think? She is accepting me. I'm going to let her do it. So this mom and sister prepped food and cross-contaminated everything. So Shanann couldn't eat any of it. Gluten-free. Nothing. Everything was made with gluten. So thank God I brought at least my daughter could eat. So as the night went on, Shanann and I went in the bathroom and Shanann told me, Mom, I had like 80 invites and only immediate family came. So Shanann called people the next day to learn that they never received an invitation. Shanann was devastated. Cindy's response. I'm not sure where to start. Maybe I should begin by explaining that by the time my daughter and I had thrown a bridal shower for Shanann in October of 2012, Chris and Shanann were living in Colorado. They had moved there and in with the Dietzes in May of 2012. Chris had taken a job with Longmont Board. We didn't have any gatherings before she flew back to North Carolina for the pre-wedding stuff. As to the engagement party, I'm assuming is what Sandy is speaking of, the bridal shower we gave her, which I have already addressed. Shanann's second engagement party was given by Nicole Canaday, who was Shanann's matron of honor, and we had nothing to do with food or invitations or anything at all. In fact, we didn't even attend that one. I heard about it later from family friends who did. Apparently, Nicole made a toast and said humorously, quote, I know there are people who would like to kill me for bringing these two together, unquote. Now, I guess I'd better explain our absence from the second engagement party. There had been an earlier engagement party that was thrown by another friend of Shanann's. Ronnie and I did go, and for whatever reason, we had seriously screwed up in Chris's eyes because he called us the next morning and said that we had really embarrassed him the night before. This came out of the blue to Ronnie and me, and I was particularly upset by it. So we canceled our plans to attend the second party so as to avoid embarrassing Chris again. I just want to jump in here and say, what the hell happened? I want to know. Did they get really drunk and embarrass him? Or no one's ever elaborated on this. I wish they would. Sorry. I'll get back. Cindy continues, if you were beginning to wonder if I ever realized that it wasn't only Shanann who didn't seem much like us, or at least me. Yeah, I did catch that a while back. What I didn't see was this. If you had asked me if I had a good relationship with my son before he met and fell in love with and married Shanann, and if I thought he loved me, I would have answered yes to both. I would have blamed her for how he had begun to treat us, but I don't know now if that was true. I have to wonder, what I still don't question is that I have always loved him and that I always will, but I guess if you were wondering if I know him or ever really did again, I would say I thought so once and now I don't. And back to Sandy Rusick and her discovery statement. Shanann and Chris were so upset they knew not to ask again. And came the wedding, and no one from his whole family came. Just his grandmother and uncle. No mom, dad, sister, aunts, and cousins. No one came. Cindy is here. The next chapter, I am told, deals with the wedding. And so I'll leave off answering that portion of Sandy's letter. I will tell you that following the wedding, I think I expected our son to apologize to us, but he never did. Instead, he wrote me the longest, ugliest email I've ever received. Sarah came by the house later that day. She found me sobbing on the floor. She didn't comfort me, she said, and I quote, Get up, get up. This is how things are now, and you have to face them and be strong. Quote. I tried to do what she said. It was good advice. Following the wedding, we did not hear from Chris until we contacted him in April of 2012. After, friends told us that he and Shanann had announced that she was pregnant on Facebook. And then this is Sandy, who said Chris, spoiled Shanann and vice versa. They were so in love and they were a great team. They moved to Colorado and lived with Shanann's friend for one year while they were building their house. Everything was great. Shanann saw something on Chris's private parts that didn't look normal. And they went to the doctors. And then in parentheses, says the word cancer. So it was removed. She saved his life. Cindy replies, According to Chris, so I'll call this family hearsay, Shanann once saw a spot on his penis. He did once receive a picture of his penis she sent to Ronnie's phone that we deleted. 
Chris said she thought it was an odd-looking thing that he chose to ignore it. There was never a single doctor's visit, and she never mentioned it again after taking the phone picture. And then Sandy Rusick. Then Shanann got pregnant with Bella Marie. Everyone was so excited and happy. Shanann and Chris were wonderful parents. Chris and Shanann were working at the Ford dealership in Longmont. Shanann was selling cars. Chris was head mechanic, a great team. Shanann was top sales. The Bella came, so Shanann stopped working because of high-risk pregnancy. She was a trooper, though, through the whole thing. Both families seem happy. Chris's sister never flew to Colorado at any time they were out there. Cindy replies, Shanann's pregnancy was announced on Facebook in April. Contacted them and everybody agreed to a fresh start. Ronnie and I don't have much money, but we bought the $600 stroller she asked for as a gesture of goodwill. And Sandy's right, both families seemed happy. I think more relieved than happy. I mean, we were very happy about a new grandchild, but by then, we were so upset that Chris had refused to talk to us for months. We, long before, had begun blaming ourselves for it. We had to make up for not going to the wedding. We would do whatever he wanted, whatever she wanted. I don't know how long Shanann was at Longmont Ford. A few months. She quit while pregnant. It was not a high-risk pregnancy, and there were no fertility drugs, as far as we knew. We were married in November, and she was pregnant by February or March. Usually four months is not considered a long time try and period for a baby. Chris was not the head mechanic at Longmont Ford. That can take years, and he was only there for about a year. He was a line mechanic, but he was working six days a week and making between sixty and eighty thousand dollars that year. Probably how he was able to qualify for the house in Frederick. Shanann did not get any money from her house in North Carolina and had to sell it furnished. Whatever happened during the sale must have hurt her credit, so Chris had to apply for the loan alone. His job at Longmont was really a good one for him. It was six days a week, and that annoyed Shanann. She told him he had carpal tunnel syndrome from the work and needed to quit. So he did, and he began at Anadarko for about 20000 less than he had been making. They did not build their house. It was a pre-planned subdivision, and that was one of the different models available, the largest one at the time. Later, some had three-car garages. This is Sandy talking again. Sandy and Ronnie came two times a year. Shanann worked at Children's Hospital at nights and sold 31 travel bags on the side. Everything was good. Shanann got pregnant with Celeste, and pregnancy was really rough on Shanann with her lupus. Very high-risk pregnancy again. Only this one was worse for Shanann. Water weight gain, severe back pain, shortness of breath, pains in her chest, fatigue, and exhaustion. Mrs. Watts says, if Nan was having a high-risk pregnancy, no one, including she or Chris, mentioned it. She, she looked fine, seemed happy and healthy, and Bella was a beautiful, happy baby. I think they were probably struggling financially, though. Shanann had been given some shift work at Children's, as Sandy said. Her friend there as a nursing supervisor, but the shifts were infrequent. I don't know if she made any money or not on the handbags. They were young, and they had a baby with another baby on the way, and a huge mortgage, and only one car, Chris's Mustang. They didn't have any furniture, so they ran up some pretty high credit card bills furnishing the house, and so I guess they probably did feel somewhat overwhelmed and wanted some help from Sandy and Frank. Cindy continues, I think family's important too. I worked for 30 years in credit control, and when Ronnie and I had our babies, my mom watched them during the day, and when I retired, I started getting to have Sarah's babies during the day, and it's a fine thing, a blessing in my life. I think that was one of the reasons we were so surprised when they moved out to Colorado, no family. We weren't thinking at the time there would be any babies for them, though. Shanann had told my best friend at their post-wedding breakfast, Oh, Cindy's going to be mad at me again. I have endometriosis and won't be able to have any children. I drugged it off. She already told us that she had lupus and fibromyalgia and celiac disease. I guess I had never thought about grandchildren from Shanann and Chris, and I didn't mind. We have grandchildren, so it was quite a surprise that she ended up being able to have babies, but a nice one. 
Sometime during the year, Cece was born. Frankie had come to stay out with them. Shanann said it was to help him with his drug problem. I don't know if Frankie ever had a drug problem or not. She also told us that he and her mom were both bipolar. I'll admit I thought Sandy could be a little overbearing, but she wasn't crazy or anything. And Frankie is just a sweetheart. Always has been. I guess if I thought anyone was bipolar, around there it was Shanann. At any rate, he left after a few weeks, later telling us he hadn't much liked being, unquote, their butler. I thought it was funny. Um, he's always been a very nice kid, Frankie, and our whole family likes him a lot and are sorry that we can't talk to him anymore. One more thing to be sorry about. True that Sarah never went to Colorado. She wasn't interested, but for that matter, Frankie never went back either, so it wasn't until Shanann came for her six-week stay in 2018 that Sarah or Frankie got to meet Cece face-to-face -face for the first time. Sandy's part continues. My husband sold everything but our house and moved to live with them to help our daughter in every way we could. Frank and I had to work to pay our bills, too. We were there for 15 months. And he replied, Sandy's right. They did just that. They sold everything they had, including this real pretty pond with Koi. They moved to Colorado, and despite Shanann and Chris having a five-bedroom house, Sandy and Frank were put down in the unfinished basement. The way the bedroom situation worked was very specific. Master bedroom for Chris and Shanann. The girls each had their own room, and it's never open for discussion because they might keep each other awake. The main rooms were her office. I think she was selling both Unique and Lulro by then, and the girls' playroom because Shanann didn't like toys in their bedrooms. So Sandy and Frank had the basement. They also, according to what Sandy told me, had to pay a thousand dollars a month that they were there to help the kids. At the time they came, Chris and Shanann told us that it had been Frank and Sandy's choice alone because they wanted to be near their grandchildren. That made sense to me and Ronnie, but I think it was hard on them financially because they had to pay the mortgage on their house in North Carolina, where Frankie was still living, and pay the rent in Colorado, too. They both had to get jobs. Sandy was a hairdresser and so got work doing that, and Frank drove a delivery truck for either Lowe's or Home Depot. I can't remember for sure which one. Their jobs helped with their finances, but left Shanann short on child care during the day, so she enrolled both the girls at the Primrose School. Mrs. Rusa continues with her discovery statement. Chris's mom came out to watch the girls for a few days while Shanann and Chris went on a business trip with LaBelle, her company, four nights and five days. During that time, we weren't allowed to see our grandchildren or even eat dinner with them as soon as we got home. She brought them upstairs and stayed upstairs. She wouldn't let us hold them or anything. I found that very odd. One day I asked her why. She said, What the hell am I here for then? She screamed at my face in front of my granddaughters and said that I was very controlling. I was just like, Wow. I texted Shanann over and over again, and she said, Relax, Mom. I'll take care of it when we get home. It's ridiculous. I never spoke to Chris's mom again. I had had enough. Mrs. Watts reply. I'll give Sandy this much. That was a pretty disastrous trip to Colorado. Chris and Shanann had asked me to come and take care of the girls so they could go to, I think it was Putacana, a Thrive thing which Shanann had started selling by then. They sent me a ticket and Shanann offered to keep the girls in daycare if I wanted, but I said no, and the three of us had a good time during the day in their subdivision. It was very nice there and all set up for families. Sandy didn't seem to want me there and made me nervous by getting angry at me after she said I had scratched one of Shanann's frying pans. The bit about the girls not eating dinner downstairs is ridiculous. No one in their right mind would have tried to eat food anywhere in Chris and Shanann's house except for the kitchen counter or the dining room if they knew what was good for them and had to keep their totally set in stone bedtime ritual. Snack, shower, or bath, tile and all, bed by seven at the latest, no exceptions. An evening when Sandy had gotten home from work, the girls wanted me to take them to the basement where their bouncy house was. I and Sandy got in it with them, and they were having a good time. Fine. Then Sandy said, I needed to bounce too. I said, no, that I would just watch. She told me, Quote, you don't know anything about children, Cindy, unquote. I was mad, I'll admit it. But then it got worse because it was 6.30 and I had to keep the girls on their schedule. 
So I took them upstairs and they weren't happy. I don't blame them, but those were the rules. They both had tantrums and Sandy came storming up and told me I was doing it wrong. Not sure what it was, but it was wrong and I had had it and I did scream and I quote, What the hell am I here for then? And I did do it in front of Belle and Cece. Then I stopped off downstairs and sat on the couch and cried. And when I just walked back upstairs and found Sandy in Cece's room and I apologized. We actually had a nice talk after that and she told me she loved Chris but that he didn't speak up enough. Since Shanann got back, there was some big fight between Sandy and Shanann, and Sandy packed up their car, her dogs included, in such a hurry that she didn't even have time to say goodbye to the girls or Chris. Shanann asked Frank to let her go and stay with her, but he didn't. He got in the car too and they drove back to North Carolina and that was that. Sandy says, After 15 months I moved back home. It was hard to leave but I felt it was for the best. I have been home now. 17 months later my whole family is dead. My beautiful daughter and my beautiful grandchildren all dead in capital letters. Mrs. Watts says, God help us all. They are all dead and he killed them. And I don't have any answers. Just grief and endless regret. Did I make him this way? Should I have done more, done less? What could I have done differently? Could I have stopped it? I miss those little girls. I will always miss them. But what is worse is they lost their lives. All the long years that belonged to them by right. He took those years. And I don't know if he understands at all what he has done to us and the Rusics, the people he left behind. There is actually one more part to Chapter 5 that I will continue in the next and last video of this series, of this particular series with Cindy Watts. I had mentioned in a comment, so I know all of you didn't see it, this author Kathleen Houston, the book deal fell through that they were writing together. Kathleen Houston is writing her own book now, and it's without the Watts and without their thoughts. So I understand it's supposed to be out either this year, the end of this year, the beginning of next year, something like that. So let me know if you guys would like me to do a book review. If you want more information on this book and the author and her thoughts and what she had to say, The Critical K has had her on her channel, I believe it's three times if not four. So I would head over there and just look for, for her in this book and or Kathleen Houston. She puts her in the title usually. I hope you've enjoyed this. Much love and peace. Thank you for listening. I love my son. Yes, I love my son no matter what. I, I just can't imagine my son doing that. He couldn't have done that. Hi, this is Kimberly. Well, I'm finally back to bring to you the last in the Tit for Tat series between Miss Sandy and Miss Cindy. To explain further, I will do a public reading or a recitation. Sorry, I mean a recitation. I'm going to narrate read out loud or recapitulate oh hell i'm just gonna read okay of cindy watt's work of literature all my broken pieces in reading this i do try to utilize my voice in a interpretive or dramatic way but others take issue with that and disagree and say that my voice is boring and puts them to sleep and stuff well you know what? They have bad taste. Why, I wonder, do I get so many comments on my voice? They should have let me do the Surrey voice. I think that would have been awesome. And just let it play and annoy people if they've done bad things like Chris Watts did. So, when reading, I do also incorporate some vivid and moving gestures. But you can't see those because I'm camera shy, but you'll have to use your imagination. For those of you that are completely lost right now, I will try to explain. I decided a few videos back that I would begin to recycle some of my over 300 videos that I've done so far. Because I do try to put a lot of thought into them and you know you've not seen them all anyway. 
I hate to see all of my efforts go to waste, so yeah, I'm going to recycle. Now, I know some of you are thinking to yourself, Kimberly, what exactly is your point and when the fuck will you be getting to it? I'm confused. I thought this was about Cindy Watts, all my broken pieces. Well, it is. When my channel was new, I found on Reddit where someone had posted Cindy's rough draft manuscript. Well, it was Cindy and an author that she was working with. A rough draft manuscript of a book they were writing together, and I grabbed it up before it was deleted. And yeah, no, I'm not ashamed. No, no, I'm not. Uh, but I am embarrassed of my original videos that I did of this. So, in my recycle series, this this is one of the first things that I did where I was talking on my channel, and I was very robotic, without emotion, and now I just let it all hang out. So, getting back to all my broken pieces, we were on chapter five. It was quite long, and I divided it up into three parts, and this is the final part. So, I do hope you visit here often as I continue to recycle more of my intros. That was the main thing I wanted to do, was to gather up and repost all of my old intros. That seems to be where the greatest interest lies with the majority of the people that visit here. And I'm not saying I'm going to do lazy posting. I'll add new shit to it, okay? I'll freshen it up and stuff. I'm doing this book because it was just too good to pass up. It really lets you know where Mrs. Cindy Watts stands. Are you lost yet? Are you annoyed with me? Please know this is how it is here at Kimberly's channel. It's very chaotic, disorganized, messy. It's out there and things often have no rhyme or reason. You know what? Deal with it. Be prepared for me to, at some point, disappoint you, because I will. Yet, you will probably come back for more, even though you find me annoying. Because I have regulars that just can't wait to jump in and give me a thumbs down the second I post a video. I just sit and laugh. It's like, they hate me, but they, they are right there when my videos are posted. Hmm. Well, thank you for your interaction. It doesn't matter that it's negative. That's the goal, is interaction. And on my channel, when I yammer, I will yammer and wander like I am now and talk about shit that has nothing to do with the video. You gotta admit, though, I am lovable. And I'm very loving. What I will do now is recite the remaining part of Miss Cindy's book, where she felt the need to respond to every single word of Mrs. Rusick's statement to Dave Baumhofer. Like, I think she was writing it to Dave Baumhofer, not for Cindy to jump in and respond to every little thing. Anyway, sadly, this chapter ends kind of in the middle of Mrs. Rusick's statement, where Cindy is like, <laughs> I have something to say about that. It's like me. I have stuff to say about things, too. And I will talk and talk, and suddenly, without warning, I end my soliloquy. I'm weird, I know. Just accept it. I have. And to further explain maybe some of my personality, it's probably not noticeable, but I'm very shy. I have fibromyalgia. I'm in pain, off and on, day in, day out. It's just a part of me now. I have a jacked up back and two unstable knees, and oh, I have ADD. Imagine that. Have you noticed it with me talking and darting all over the place? I also suffer from insomnia, or when I don't have insomnia, I will have a sleep marathon where I go for like 20 straight hours. My husband's holding a mirror under my nose, you know, to see if I'm breathing. I also have a coffee and a chocolate addiction. I'm very unpredictable, and I refuse to go over to the naked and afraid side of Watts Island. I'm happy where I am. I'm much too delicate for all that shit. Moving on. In today's reading, Mrs. Watts seems to be pondering very deeply the lifestyle of Chris and Shanann. She does not respect the rules of their house. Their rules. She wonders why and how Chris seemed to have just floated away from her and gravitated towards his wife. 
and why in the world would he be in agreement with her on how to run their household raise their children and run their finances in the ground i think we all wonder about the what ifs what if pris hatton lost his fucking mind and killed his lovely family i often try to picture what they were going to do about being in financial ruin. They were just ignoring it, to my knowledge. There's probably a ton of texts where they did talk about it that weren't put in the discovery. That's my thought. I wonder, how in hell were they able to obtain credit for plane tickets and meals out and vacationing at the beach? How? It was probably those ridiculous interest rates on their credit cards somewhere in the neighborhood, you know, 29.999%, and if you're late on one payment, it'll go up to, like, 39.999. Uh, Mrs. Watts, she is often asking son, What's wrong, son? What's wrong? Like, when he was a kid, why are you chanting and praying in the bathroom? Are you okay? I imagine his mother, Miss Cindy, would get on her hands and knees and peer and shout under the bathroom door, Christopher, Christopher, are you okay? You want a Coca-Cola and some crackers? One thing I want to mention, she brings up Shanann's neck surgery, and she says it's elective. I worked in hospitals for many years. And elective simply means it's scheduled in advance. It's not like a cosmetic procedure. People try to make it sound like that. No, you can have a triple bypass and it's elective because they schedule it. Anything that's not an emergency surgery is considered elective. So I just wanted to clear that up. It's not like you just decided you want surgery for no good reason and your doctor's like, oh, okay, sure. And what the hell kind of medical insurance did they have? Didn't Chris say he had medical and dental for the family through work? Why did they owe in the neighborhood of $25,000 on her surgery? Did he have that medical plan that's two ninety nine a week, catastrophic bullshit? I, shit doesn't make sense. And then, yeah, she talks about they didn't talk to her about the bankruptcy. What well, can you imagine the lecture they would have received? Yeah, I'll bet they didn't talk to Cindy, given her line of work, about bankruptcy in 2015. She breaks it down for you, though, and calling out, there was not much in the way of medical bills at that time, but over $70,000 in unsecured debt. That would be shopping, clothing, furniture, trips, was those parties, as she called them. Not paying bills, but I do like how Cindy calls Chris and shit out on some of his bullshit about not knowing about the spending and heading for another financial train wreck. Dumpster fire. Credit control. That was the line of work Cindy was in before she retired. Now, what is a credit controller and what do they do? credit controller is responsible for managing the debts of a business. They are accountable for recovering any unpaid money that is owed to an organization or businesses or from individuals. Could you imagine getting a phone call from her about the late payment? Chris said at one point she worked at a used car dealership where they will finance your car for you. It's for people that can't qualify, say at their bank or credit union. I know I'm babbling. I'll be done in a minute. After reading, I'm going to play the full interview that Cindy did right after the sentencing. You know, where she was sitting in her dining room. I know most have probably seen it, but I thought it was fitting to go along with this book. Cindy, not one to keep her thoughts to herself on this shit show. Well, actually, never mind. <laughs> I did a video one time. Maybe I'll hook that on the end, too. I did a series of four, I called it a documentary, but it's not like a real documentary, but just flip and humor me, okay? Just where I pulled stuff from Twitter organized it and I'll play it at the end for you where it breaks up her interview you can just watch it by itself or you can watch it in this little ditty that I did I'll put time stamps and one last thing before I play the reading Cindy please just accept that your son at some point when he was 
playing out in the backyard, you know, and how he liked to climb the trees. At some point, he fell out of the dumbass tree and hit every fucking branch on the way down. All right? Well, hope you enjoy this video and hope this makes up or not talking in the video that I posted before this one. But, you know, some days I'm just not feeling it and I have stuff, you know. Not my stuff, other stuff. People want to drag me into their shit. And I'm like, no, I'm kicking and screaming. Leave me alone. Leave me out of it. Anyway, I gotta go. And I know you want to hear the video. So, much love and peace. And thank you for listening. Guys, I have breaking news. I just realized that the author that was working with Cindy, she went ahead and finished the book and it was released about a month ago. So guess what? I'm going to be doing, yes, a book review on Kathleen McKenna Houston's book called Blood and Marriage. And if it's the exact same in the beginning, I'm downloading the uh, Kindle edition right now, but if it's the exact same in the beginning, I'll just pick up from where we've left off here today. I'm excited. Now, I'm not going to be able to read it in full as I've been doing with this other one due to copyright reasons, but I'll give you a really good review on it, I promise. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Love you guys. Cindy continues, I always told myself he was like Ronnie because Ronnie had always been quiet, but he's nothing like Ronnie. I don't know, I'd spend all day and night a year later still trying to find something, anything that I missed, and I must have, but I don't have any answers. We have grief, it will always be with us. I know grief, it walks with me. I know confusion and despair, but I don't think I know my son. And now Sandra speaking. Everything seemed fine. Our daughter never spoke about anything bad. She did speak to us about bankruptcy a lot of debt with all the medical bills. Now Cindy again. Sandy and Frank were way ahead of us then. Chris never told us about the bankruptcy at all. I found out later, after, and there wasn't much in the way of medical debt in 2015 when they declared there was 70000 in unsecured debt, however, stuff they had bought. Somewhere in there, Chris had sold his Mustang to get cash for the Lexus down payment lease. By then he had his work truck. When I look at the bankruptcy file and so much money and for what, clothes, trips they couldn't afford, Sandy and Frank had had to give the money for their passports for Punta Gana. If they couldn't pay for that, what in the world did they go on the trip for? Any of those trips that were really just parties where they bought more overpriced clothing, this time Thrive stuff. It was crazy spending. Chris claims now he didn't know how bad their money situation was. I say, really? Two years later, they were right there again, and it's not too hard to figure, is it? He was making 60000 a year. Their mortgage was 2700 Another 150 for the homeowners. 2000 a month for daycare. 600 a month for car payments, not counting insurance. They were already in the negative before utilities and food, so why not go on to pricey trips and buy clothes and toys and get your nails done on Shadan's part? They treated money like monopoly cash, and two short years later they were underwater again, having learned nothing, and apparently neither had their banks, because how anyone was stupid enough to give those two credit is beyond me. Bella and Celeste were back and forth to doctors, misdiagnosed for two years. I told Shanann that they had asthma and she needed to fire that doctor. One day she went in and the PA was there and she diagnosed them with asthma. Finally, the girls were doing great. Other than earplugs put in and the girls being very allergic to tree nuts, which would have caused them death. It's true that both the girls suffered from failure to diagnose or to get the right diagnosis that people in their lives seemed to need for them. Neither of the girls ever displayed any asthmatic symptoms when I was there, and Chris admits now that the most he saw was Cece coughing sometimes when she ate too fast. Bella did not suffer from any allergies at all. Despite this, she was told that whatever Cece was allergic to, and sometimes that was chocolate, sometimes peanuts, and later tree nuts, she was not allowed any of those things either. Four is young for this. 
I don't know which of them, Chris or Shanann, told her that if Cece ate coconut, she wouldn't wake up. I wish no one had. She was a very quiet, gentle, frightened little girl, and after the age of two, she never looked healthy, and her hair wouldn't grow, and she was self-conscious about it. Now I know she had the added worry of her sister dying on her little shoulders. Mama Bear Shanann called her. She wasn't a Mama Bear, she was a baby. But she was right to worry, I guess, because the sister did die, didn't she? Chris killed her. Killed them both. I don't think they had any allergies at all. I don't think they should have been dosed up with Tylenol every single night of their lives. And here's another thing that haunts me. The last day of their lives, they went to a birthday party, and there was cake and ice cream, and those babies had to stand and look at it. None for them, not even on the last day of their lives. Celeste was born with her esophagus too small, and they went in three times to enlarge it. Steroids like crazy to help her breathe for one and a half years or longer, all until they were diagnosed with asthma, then Shanann with her neck surgery, which out of pocket was $25,000 they owed. So that's why there was so much debt. Sandy must be referring to the second go-round of debt here because Shanann's neck surgery was after that bankruptcy. It was elective and so costly, as were most of the tests on the girls. If Cece was born with anything wrong with her, it sure never showed. She was the healthiest, most active, and happiest little girl. I hate that she went through all of those procedures and all of those drugs. From birth, both girls were left to cry it out, quote unquote. Chris and Shanann said it was something called baby wise. I thought it was horrible. Two hour naps unless they were at daycare. Drugs at 6 p.m. every single night, sick or not bed at 6.30 or 7 at the latest, those loud rain machines. I was told to never go into them when they cried, no rocking, ever. I'd watch Bella crawl out of bed in the dark and crawl to her bookshelf, then sit in a corner holding a book she couldn't see in the dark. If the children had really had asthma, wouldn't having let them cry like that have set off the asthma or Cece's choking? I noticed that when we would FaceTime every night for four years straight. Looking back, starting late May 2018, when we FaceTimed, Chris was putting the phone all over the room, ceiling, floor, etc. I said, Chris, are you all right? Then he would FaceTime normally. And then it goes back to Sandy. Before Shanann came to North Carolina, Celeste had a rash in her private area, and she went to get a face cloth and some cream. Chris had the phone. I said, Chris, let me see how bad it is, being that I am an aide. So I still couldn't see. So I said, wait, let me move my screen because I couldn't see. He put it right on her private parts. Oh, I was mad. Then back to Sandy. All I can say to this is they were a very strange family. My son, his wife, her parents. Or maybe I should say strange to me. From the beginning, I had never seen anyone who never, and I do mean never, put their phone down like Shanann. Meals, conversations, you name it, the phone was out. The phone caused an unpleasant incident the weekend of the engagement, but we don't talk of that. The phone sent Ronnie and I pictures of our son's penis. The phone was on and not just when she was making videos. Her parents did indeed FaceTime with them constantly. And though Chris did what Shanann said always, he did never warm to the videos and constant FaceTime every night. It would have been painful for one thing, as neither Ronnie nor Chris talk much, and seeing how the kids ate dinner isn't necessary. Why did they take the phone into the bathroom? It seems odd. But then, why did they take pictures of every time the girls were at the hospital? It was all just weird. So this unattractive story neither surprises me or makes me wish we had FaceTimed more. And back to Mrs. Rusick. Shanann wanted to come for six weeks this summer so she can introduce the girls to Chris's sister, who never met Celeste or Uncle Frankie, our son. Before the year started back to school, dance, classes, etc., it was the best time was now. We were thrilled. Shanann stayed the week here, then the weekends with Chris's parents and Mrs. Watts. Okay, I'm going to break off for this for a while. The rest of Sandy's letter concerns the last weeks of their lives, and there is a lot to tell before I get to that. 
I don't know why Shanann came to North Carolina for so long. They were facing losing their house and basically homelessness unless they moved back to North Carolina and in with one set or the other of parents. Maybe it was to see how that would go. I'll give you a hint. Not well. Shanann looked at two very expensive houses for sale while she was here. Maybe she or they, though I don't think it was they because Chris was already in love with another woman, but possibly she thought they could start over again in North Carolina like they had in Colorado. If so, I don't think it would have been easy. They weren't just broke, they were drowning in debt with little chance of getting out. They couldn't declare bankruptcy again. They were only two years out of the first one. So it really would have meant living with one family or the other, and if those weeks were an indicator, I'd help Shanann. She must have been growing desperate. In the meantime, I have to wonder what Chris's solution was. I'm sorry, I have to break in here. She wonders what Chris's solution was. Well, we saw his solution. It was to kill his family, like a dumb fuck. Good God Almighty, son. What'd you do, haul the bodies off or something? I mean, sorry, back to Mrs. Watts. Thank you for staying with me so far, and I'll answer the rest of Sandy's letter later on. This is where the unfinished manuscript ends. I don't know that there's been any more posted. I'm going to look for it. If any of you find it, please let me know. Just message me in one of the comments. And thank you for listening. Much love and peace. ...who pleaded guilty to murdering his entire family, reaching out to the problem solvers. I'm Jeremy Hubbard. And I'm Aristea Brady. You may remember earlier this month, Christopher Watts admitted in court to killing his pregnant wife and two young daughters. Well, tonight, his mother is speaking to Fox 31 for the very first time, and she tells us she believes that he was coerced into taking the plea deal. Fox 31's Kagan Harsha brings us the story new tonight at 10. Kagan. Yeah, I just got off the phone with Cindy Watts a few moments ago. She says the last several months have been a nightmare for her family, and she understands her son Chris is to blame, she says, for much of that. However, she insists he is not guilty of all that he has admitted to as part of that plea deal, even though she also admits she doesn't have a lot of evidence to back that up. He went into a rage and he killed her when he saw her killing, uh, strangling Celeste. Cindy Watts says she knows her son Chris is guilty of murder, but she does not believe he murdered his two kids. He did kill her, uh, but for the kids, no. It's very difficult. It's very difficult because I, I just can't imagine my son doing that. He couldn't have done that. Cindy Watts spoke to us via FaceTime from her home in North Carolina, and she tells us she believes her son was coerced by prosecutors into accepting a plea deal. Yes, I want to stop it before it's too late. I, 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 I want to talk to him. We haven't been able to talk to him. I love my son. Yes, I love my son no matter what no matter what and i want to fight for him and i don't want him to go down for something that he didn't do and city says this is based on the conversation she had with him a half hour conversation shortly after he was arrested chris watts will avoid the death penalty in exchange for that plea deal i asked cindy what she thinks should happen to her son and she didn't really have an answer to that, insisting Chris only reacted after seeing his wife strangling their daughters. Now, his wife, Shanann's family, of course, has a very different opinion about what happened. We've reached out to them several times in the past, but they have not wanted to comment publicly about their daughter's murder. So earlier this month, of course, Christopher Watts admitted in court to killing his pregnant wife and two young daughters. Now his mother speaking out, saying she doesn't believe that happened. Now you may remember Chris Watts admitted in court to killing his pregnant wife and two young daughters. That was part of a plea deal. But now his mother, Cindy, says she wants to stop the deal before it's too late. She says that Chris admitted to killing his wife, Shanann, but insists he did not strangle his two young daughters. Yes, I want to stop it before it's too late. I, I, I want to talk to him. We haven't been able to talk to him. I love my son. Yes, I love my son no matter what. No matter what. And I want to fight for him. And I don't want him to go down for something that he didn't do. Now, Cindy says she's only been able to speak to her son once since he was arrested. Chris Watts will avoid the death penalty in exchange for that plea deal. Now, Shanann's family just released this statement into our newsroom minutes ago. It said in part, yes, 
Chris Watts still chose to murder Shanann, Bella, and Celeste, and Nico. That was the unborn child. Chris Watts still chose to dump the bodies of his own family in oil tanks, and Chris Watts still chose to lie about it until he could lie no more. He pled guilty to murdering his family because he is guilty. Monday evening, the parents of Chris Watts gave an interview in which they attempted to defend their son. In doing so, they felt the need to make vicious, grotesque, and utterly false statements about Shanann. Their false statements, however hurtful and inaccurate, will never alter the truth about Shanann and will never alter alter the truth about the crimes committed by their son, Chris Watts. Now, Chris Watts will be formally sentenced on November 19th. I wake up every, every morning just crying, you know, thinking this is not going to be what's going to happen every single day. It's just so hard to get through it. I just don't know how to get through it. Tell me about his childhood. Did he play sports? Was he in scouts? What kinds of things did, yes, did he, he do? Yes, he played sports. He played sports from the time he was five years old up until he was 17. And he was in basketball, he was in baseball, he was in football, and uh, loved NASCAR. He and his dad went to the NASCAR races all the time. Uh, loved sports. Loved sports. And he had, he, he was a good kid, uh, had two best friends, and that's who he grew up with and still are friends with them today. And uh, there's nothing, nothing that would have predicted any of this could have ever happened. Yeah. Nothing, nothing in his childhood at all. I would have never in a million years thought something like this could happen to him at all. You didn't see things like him getting into fights? Or no, no, no fighting. Uh, he was quiet and he got along with people and he didn't start anything and he, he was um, a perfect teenager, tell you the truth, he did not even rebel. He wanted to go to NASCAR Tech. We made that possible for him. What did he do after he finished school? He worked at the dealership as a service technician and was making good money and loved it. He bought a, uh, a toolbox and he started buying his tools and uh, um, enjoyed it. He yeah. was doing well. When and where did he meet Shanann? They met and he liked her, she liked him, but it didn't, I don't think it was love at first sight or anything. They, they took a little while and I guess got to know each other and, you know, dated. Uh, it was always a little, a little strange that she always said a lot of things about Chris in front of me that I didn't like. Like, this isn't the kind of person I would date. Um, he doesn't know how to do this, or he doesn't know how to do that. Um, he looks like a skater boy. Look at his hair. Look how much stuff he puts on his hair. It's just, it was just on and on and on, and I just got a bad feeling. And they got married in 2012. Did they get married in North Carolina? They did. Mm -hmm. How was that? Oh, we didn't attend. Really? Mm -mm. We didn't attend because Shanann and I just couldn't get along. And um, I don't, I didn't like the way she, she treated him. What do you know about their marriage and their issues? Oh, very little. Very little. You can only observe. I could only observe what, what I saw when I was around them. Christopher was always seemed anxious and he, he when she needed something i mean he would run he wouldn't walk he would run he would get it he just always seemed to be right there at, at her beck and call 
And that did that seem odd to you? Or? Very odd. It was very odd. I, he just seemed nervous. So how much did you see them over these last six years? Uh, probably twice a year. We would go up there. Did you stay with them? Or? Yeah, we would stay with them and uh, stay a week and then come back home. Tell me about Bella and Celeste. Oh, Bella was just like Chris, just, just like him, shy, cautious, conservative. Uh, Cece was a ball of fire and she was fearless completely fearless. She just loved to run, 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 run. So they, they were wonderful. It breaks my heart to know that they're not here. They were beautiful children, beautiful children. What did they call you? Mimi. Mimi? And mm -hmm. about Ronnie, what did they call? Papa. Do you think Chris loves Shanann? Oh God, he loved her. Yes. I believe he loved her at first. I believe he did. But I think as the years went on, I think it just being being in a that kind of a relationship which the social worker even said they that marriage should have ended a long time ago. Shanann's pregnancy and was what did, what did Chris tell you about that? Was he excited? Was No, I don't think he was. I think it was a shock to him. And he said that they have been talking about divorce. That, uh, you know, they are, not, they are not compatible anymore. And he was not happy anymore. And uh, I finally thought uh, he's finally seen the light. And I take it Chris had never been in trouble with the law? Never. He's got one speeding ticket and didn't even know about that. Tell me what happened when they were reported missing. What, what did you find out? How did you find out? Who, did you, who told you? I think Ronnie called me. Ronnie called me and said that they're missing. And I thought, I don't believe it. I didn't believe they were missing. I believe that she was going to punish Chris. She was just going to punish him, take the girls, and just punish him. I had no idea of anything else. Christopher called and said, Mom, uh, they're searching the house. I said, okay, that's fine. I mean, and I still was not worried. I, hadn't, I was not worried. I just thought Shanann had run off with girls. So walk me through the sequence of events over the next few days. Did you and your husband travel to Colorado? Ronnie did. Okay. Ronnie did. And I mean, Christopher let everybody come in. Her phone is there. Her purse is there. Everything is there. And, but there's no kids and there's no Shanann. And um, I still was, I was not worried. You know, I thought, she has just gone off and I'm going to punish you for this and you can worry about me. But when Christopher called us and he said, uh, I said, do you want us to come down now? He said, tell dad I need him. Tell dad I need him to come down. I said, what about me? He said, no mom, just stay. Just send dad. And he picked him up at the airport and they drove to the police station. And Chris still didn't say anything to him. Nothing. He had already been interrogated seven hours prior to that. He had already let the police go into his home, search everything. Um, he had, and he was going in for another interrogation. The next thing, after five hours, uh, they called Ronnie and said that uh, your son wants to talk to you before he tells us anything. And that's when. Christopher broke down and cried and said, I'm sorry, Dad. He said, I went into a rage and I killed her after she killed Cece and Bella. And he found out where he is and then they wouldn't let him see him. He couldn't see him. And so he was going back to the airport when his public defender called him and told him to come back. 
So and that's when Ronnie met his public defender. And so talked to her for a while. And uh, they kept in touch with us and let us know what's going on. And then what was the next update that you got? Was it? The next update I got was uh, Ronnie called Jamie and told them they found their bodies. And they rushed over here. Nobody told me anything until they walked through the door. And they told me what happened and I, I just fell to the floor. I just fell to the floor. It was, it was uh, unbelievable. And it's been unbelievable ever since. And what did his attorneys tell you about contact with him? You know, starting what, with his None. arrest. No contact. Everything is recorded. No contact. Uh, no letter writing. Uh, I didn't see the harm in the letters. You know, hi, son love you keep fighting uh we are here to support you what is wrong with that what can the da do uh, about letters like this why couldn't we just write him a letter we were we did what we were told to do when they called us to tell us that chris was thinking of a plea that he wanted to speak to us about it and when we got down there, it was a lie. They, he, they wouldn't let us talk to him about anything. And then we had to talk to him through a, a screen and a phone. And uh, he just looked, uh, he, uh, he, he was crying. I mean, he, he, he wasn't crying. He was, you could see the movement in his mouth that when I talked about Bella and I talked about Cece and the memorial service that we had for, for them, and he asked what kind of what pictures did we use and you know what was the song uh, just you can see how he was trying to hold back tears what um what day was that do you remember well we flew in on that monday we flew in on monday and we saw him monday night and then the plea deal was on tuesday so monday night was when they when you wanted to talk to him about yes it. yes and we weren't allowed and it would have it would have helped us so much to be able to talk to him i wouldn't have to go through all this now everything just seems to be shrouded in secrecy and 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 just tell us what is going on let us ask chris if it's okay if you talk to us mm -hmm. i just don't like the way it was handled from the very beginning i don't like the way it was handled i want to save your life that's all we're just here, we're going to save his life. We don't, we don't, we want him to get life in prison. It was like they already knew he was guilty. And this was the end of it. Were you worried about the death penalty being a possibility? No, no. I didn't care about the death penalty. Nobody's going to die in Colorado. I don't think anyone has, what, one person? Colorado is changing. So, I... People stay on the on death row forever. There was no. I think you'd be safer on death row. And her parents said they didn't want any more death. So I don't see how the death penalty could have mattered. All I want is the truth. I just want the truth. That's it. And I know Chris he would take responsibility. And I guess. Um, maybe he is. I don't know. I don't know. I just can't see him doing that. What do you think the truth is about how Shanann and Bella and Celeste died? Oh, God, I don't know anymore, honestly. I don't know his frame of mind. and I, I, I don't know his frame of mind because why... Would you plead guilty to something you didn't do? And that's all I want to know. Why would you plead guilty if you didn't do it? If you told your dad you didn't do it? And that's what I want to know. And they said, well, you'll, be, you'll find all that out. Christopher will talk to you when and after 
he's sentenced. Well, isn't that too late then? I mean, isn't it too late? What if he tells me, no, I didn't do it? I just took this plea deal because they told me I was going to go to jail anyway. I just want the truth. All of us just want to want the truth. That's all. I, I, but I would like to know what what triggered it. How can a perfectly a normal young man, and he, he's normal, he was normal, but he wasn't evaluated when he came in to the system. He wasn't normal if he did this. It must be bewildering. It's bewildering to me. It is. It is absolutely. How does this happen? How did this happen? And I go back in my mind thinking, was there something I didn't pick up with on Chris? But I can't think of anything except he was quiet. It sounds like in your own mind, you're unsure as to what happened. Yes. Have you... Have you reconciled the idea that he could have done all of this? Yes. And that scares me to death. It scares me to death to think that he could have done all of this. And I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there right now. But in, I don't see why he's pleading guilty. I wouldn't. I'd fight. I'd fight to the end. But then you ask yourself, would a normal person put, dispose of the bodies the way you did? And I would have called 911 if it happened like that. What would you say to Chris right now if he were sitting here? If we were by ourselves? Yeah. I would say, Christopher, I need to know what happened that night. I need to know what happened. I've got I've got to I've got to get these thoughts out of my head. I, I what I think could have happened, but I need to know. And I think in time he will tell me. Probably nothing you ever would have imagined you no. would have faced. Never, never, no, and, and not, not from the, the son that I raised and Ronnie raised and, and our children, you know, we just, we just did everything for them. We worked for them and we wanted them to have a good, good life, good education and we stressed education. Uh, and they're, they were both doing well. I thought, you know, I knew marriages can be bad, but you can get out of them and, and go on. But I don't know what was going through anybody's mind that night. I mean, I feel too much. I mean, I definitely feel everything way too much and have a conscious that, conscience that I just feel way too much. What do you want to happen now? What would you hope would happen now? Uh, well, I, I want Chris to have his day in court. I mean, I need to know. Uh, I mean, I'd feel wonderful if I could talk to him and he could tell me what happened. And then we can all go on. But if he didn't do it, if he did not do this, then I, 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 need to, I, need, I need somebody to defend him. I need someone to defend him if he did not do this. Do they have the evidence? He's my son. I have, I, I got to do everything I, I, I've got to do everything I can to help to make sure that, that he is defended properly. But he said this was his decision, so I don't know. There's doubt. I have doubt that he did it. I can't see that he did it. I just cannot see him doing that as much as he loved his girls. How do you do that? I just don't see it. I just can't see him doing it. I just wanted to make sure that he has... A, I just wanted a defense. I wanted him to be defended. And you haven't had any discussions with his attorneys about this? No. 
I asked them, do you know what happened? They said, no. We don't. only person that knows what happened is Chris. Well, then he's told you his story, you know, in the affidavit. They said they would defend him if he wanted to, to go forward, but he said he didn't want to go forward. And the bottom line is you would have liked to have been part of that discussion with him I before you made that decision. That's what I thought we were going down there for. At least let us talk to him. Let us talk to him. It would have made all the difference in the world if they would have just let us talk to him. If he was going to do this, what difference does it make who's, who's listening? But he has our love. He has our unconditional love. I will never abandon my son. He did a horrible, horrible, if, if that comes to pass that he did this, then I still love him. He's my son. And I will always love him. And a lot of people don't understand that. And I don't understand that why they don't. Well, could you talk a little bit about um, some things we talked about yesterday? You said, you know, I think I think your exact words were, he's not the psychopath next he door. He isn't. He's not the sociopath next door. He's not the psychopath. He didn't kill little small animals. He he didn't do any of these things. He was he was a good child. Uh, I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything that was abnormal about him, except he was socially awkward. You know, he had trouble socializing, but so did I when I was younger. You, I think you learn that as you grow, and I think he felt a little bit more comfortable and more comfortable in his skin, and he, he, uh, he just, uh, I don't think he just had the right person at his side. I don't. That relationship was toxic from the very beginning. What would you say to Shanann's family if you could talk to them? God, I'm so sorry this happened. You know, for both our families, because we both lost everything. You know, they lost a daughter, we lost our son. We lost our grandchildren. We all lost. Everybody did. And it, it, you'll never get it back. And they were precious. They were so, so precious. 